Welcome to another episode of the Bandage Podcast, a weekly wrap-up of the most trending healthcare news. Each week, join me and my co-host Alex Ross as we'll discuss the latest in healthcare, health IT, and compliance. In this week's episode, we discuss expanding training for nurses, a mobile health clinic for children, and a new COVID-19 vaccine. Let's wrap things up. This is episode 75 for the week of March 8th. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Alex Ross. Before we get started, our diagnosis code of the week is M01X31, direct infection of right wrist in infectious and parasitic diseases classified elsewhere. Wow. Oh, that that code sounds very familiar. Uh, Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, just happened to me. Uh, Just showed up on the bill that came in the mail yesterday. Um, Mm -hmm. This happened a a little bit ago, admittedly. Um, So this infection of my right wrist was actually caused by Lyme disease. So um, the Lyme disease caused arthropathy, which is, uh, you know, like an arthritic reaction to this disease. And specifically in my right Mm -hmm. wrist is where things got really, really bad. Um, Luckily, though, it it could have been much worse because when I went, Ohio was kind of in the, the height of COVID. And thankfully, I, I tested negative and I, I got out of there alone without catching COVID. Because if I did, then the bill would have said Corona and Lyme disease. And I can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not talking about COVID or are we? Because <laughs> that would be bad. Anyways, Absolutely. Things let's are looking get into good, the though. news. Okay. Let's get into the news. First up, more resources to help with nursing shortage. A Louisiana Health System and Community College in New Orleans are working together to expand training for nurses and allied health professionals. Oshner Health will help fund a new building to consolidate Delgado Community College's Allied Health Division and its charity school of nursing. Say that 10 times fast. This partnership (laughs) will also cover full-time tuition for Oshner employees in nursing and health programs at Delgado, which has around 1,200 graduates in these programs each year. The new building is slated to break ground in the spring and open for classes in 2023. This is happening at the time when Louisiana State Board of Nursing expects a significant shortage of nurses across the state. I'm surprised to hear that there's a shortage of nurses. Really? Uh, It seems like everybody I went to high school with is a nurse nowadays. That's true. There is a lot of nurses, but there's just not enough nurses, Alex, because baby boomers are such a large population and they're getting older. That's the reason. That's and true. We can't keep and up. I will say that up. I've noticed that medical centers, especially around here, they're still building new buildings and, and growing and expanding, um, even though we we tend to think that in the last year, revenues from a a patient responsibility standpoint tended to trend a little bit downwards due to the postponement of a lot of elective procedures. Um, But as we go into 2021 here, as we're getting deeper into it, we still got to catch up on all of those. So Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that backlog also has a a pretty big part of it. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I, uh, you know, when it comes to medical stuff or organizations, I just assume that if they're a large health organization, they just have unlimited money. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, I'm just, it's just like, because I guess everyone has medical problems. So it's just like, okay, well, you know, they're never going to go out of business unless for some reason it's a small health organization, but that's not the case for Oshner Health. So, right. yeah. Well, cool. Happy for them. <laughs> Next up, taking healthcare on the road. Nemours Children's Hospital is bringing healthcare to uninsured children in Central Florida communities. One of the doctors had the idea to repurpose an underused vehicle at Nemours for the initiative that will take healthcare out into the community. 20 children are identified each week whose family income is less than or equal to 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. These children will receive well check visits from the mobile clinic at select sites each Saturday. Children will also be screened for social issues that may impact their health, such as homelessness and language difficulties, 
to transportation and income barriers that prevent them from getting an appointment. Yeah, so, you know, Namors is saying some more children um, <laughs> with their <laughs> increased in, the, in a mobile health facility. That's nice. You've seen a lot of, you we're starting to see a lot more mobile clinics. It's almost like, you know, the, 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 the trend from the early 2010s with the food trucks where food trucks were everywhere. Now, mobile clinics are the new food trucks without the food. That's what we need, a resurgence of food trucks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Those Not are so to go awesome. completely off topic because, but, you know, in a time when everybody should be you know, eating outside or separate on their own, like food trucks are perfect. You don't have any yeah, kind of dining also, establishment to worry about. I mean, alternatively, it's also not good because the workers are in a little truck. So if one of them gets sick. Most food trucks I've met are family owned kind of deals. So they're in contact with each other regularly anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, though I, I agree there is a potential there, but there's is in any commercial kitchen that's operating yeah. right now. Anyways. Food truck clinics is a new idea. It's a million dollar idea. Um, you know, anything that's related to helping homeless, especially, I mean, whether or not they're children, but especially if they are children is always very, uh, motivational and encouraging. It kind of brings you some hope to society because it's like, Hey, we actually care about, uh, those who are less fortunate than right. the majority. So I, I don't mean to be kind of negative about this story in particular, but. For me, looking at it as a practical standpoint, 20 children each week is, is not a whole lot. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to detract from their, um, their mission because it is really an admirable one that needs to get done. The, the question becomes, where do we go from here? So mm -hmm. is it a successful program and therefore they should actually expand their fleet and, and expand their offering? Um, is it a program that other hospitals, other offices may be able to to take a uh, take part in in their own communities? Um, how do we expand this offering so that the effects these this great cause really um, gets to the people who need it? Right. Next up, you only have one shot. <laughs> The Johnson and Johnson COVID nineteen vaccine received authorization for use last weekend. This is the third vaccine to receive authorization in the United States. It's also the first single dose and the only one that doesn't require ultra cold storage. The company began shipping the first 3.9 million doses last week, and it's expected to scale up supply in the coming weeks with around 16 million additional doses by the end of March. The vaccines will be limited at first, but the company is committed to delivering 100 million doses by June and up to a billion by the end of 2021. Way to go, J and J. Yeah, way to go, J and J. Bringing home the vaccine. Better late than like, never. No, I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you had one shot or one opportunity to get a COVID nineteen vaccine, would you capture it or just let it slip? Yeah, one of the the challenges with the two shot vaccines first, obviously, is storage. Um, but second is yeah. is coordinating because because it takes those two steps. People who only get one of them, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the effect that is needed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you have to coordinate for that second. And that becomes more difficult than just coordinating a walk in, get your vaccine and walk out yeah. kind of deal. I wonder if the if the side effects for this one is as bad as the other one, like the Moderna one specifically, because I feel like isn't the Moderna one the more popular one? I think that's the one that the majority of people are getting for for whatever reason. Maybe they can just produce it faster. But that one requires two shots. The first one makes you sleepy and it hurts, makes your arm hurt like for the day. And then the second one gives you a fever. Um, my significant other got both of them. The second one, the first one, you know, she had pain. And the second one, she was like out all weekend because she had this fever and was acting like it was the end of the world. So um, <laughs> that was probably a little bit more dramatized on her part, but you know, you should still get your vaccine regardless. So the, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is using technology that is older. Like it's more time tested. Whereas the mm -hmm. other two are using a, a newer vaccine technology, which 
you know, benefits being it allowed them to produce what seems to be a viable vaccine very quickly and yeah. get that out. Um, the downside is obviously that we don't know if it has long term effectiveness or if it's something that's going to have to be like a flu shot. We, we don't know um, really like <laughs> the recommendations I'm seeing is is kind of like after three months from the vaccine, that might be it. Right. It may start losing effectiveness. So having the Johnson and Johnson option certainly is is kind of bolstering the efforts in general and and we see trends going downwards everywhere and that's mm -hmm. really encouraging to see because you know we're in we're in flu season now and numbers are still going down so you know that's that's pretty encouraging yes we are in the home stretch if this was a uh, uh, a baseball game we're on third base you know there's a either a, a, someone who's going to bunt at home or hit a single um, it's just a matter of time, you know, I would say, <laughs> I would say the count right now is zero and one, um, top of the ninth. We're good to go. And with that, let's get into our next segment. B R E A C H breach patrol. It's a breach. All of the latest cybersecurity breaches. Welcome to breach patrol. We're talking about the latest breaches all across the world. First up. You shouldn't cry over spilled milk, but maybe you should over spilled data. Lactalis, the world's leading dairy group, disclosed a cyber attack after unknown threat actors breached some of the company's systems. The company has 85,000 employees in 51 countries and exports dairy products to over 100 countries. Lactalis says that only a limited number of computers on its network were compromised. An investigation revealed no data has been stolen at this point. Lactalis has taken IT systems offline on all company sites impacted by the attack. They are working to protect the interests of customers, partners, and employees. Mm -hmm. Here's the danger. Whatever information they have, they're going to they're gonna launch phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks and maybe some blackmail. Who knows? But because. they are going to milk everybody dry. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to milk this attack for as long as they can. Yep. You know, they probably didn't get that much information. Um, because, I mean, when it comes to it, it's a milk company. And what kind of customer information do they really have now? Other than, like, you know, what type of milk you prefer? Are you a 1% drinker, skim milk drinker? <laughs> do you like whole milk? You probably don't have data on almond milk because that's a different organization. But um, what I wonder if there's something where it's like, you know, they could potentially get into the machines that process the milk mm -hmm. and add some additives or something that like make it harmful for the regular, regular everyday consumer to do. Or just to not, cons not instruct a particular machine that maybe, you know, siphons uh diseases like e coli or something like that and just leave it there so then there's a big chance for like an e coli outbreak you know maybe that maybe that's, that sounds a little far-fetched that's, but... that's not exactly how milk production works <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know maybe i'm just writing a script for a really good movie oh really good sure yeah exactly i, I guess you could say though that uh you know relations between this company and, and its customers and employees are a little strained right now. Uh, I guess it's it's made some sour cream. Next up, your ticket to free data. Ticket Counter suffered a breach after a user database containing 1.9 million unique email addresses was stolen from an unsecured staging server. Ticket Counter is a Dutch e-ticketing platform that allows clients such as zoos, parks, and events to provide online tickets to their venues. The company copied a database to a Microsoft Azure server to test an anonymization process that replaces personal data with fake details. But after copying the database, it wasn't secured properly and a threat actor was able to download it. This threat actor posted it to a hacked form to sell, but quickly took the post down, claiming that the database was sold privately. The details exposed full names, email addresses, phone numbers, IP addresses, and hashed passwords. It's since been posted for free on my hacker form. 
interesting that they said it's been sold and took it down and then it shows up for free. It makes you yeah, wonder if totally they're like, uh, is there like the heroes of the hacker world where they just buy databases and post them for free? Like, mm-hmm. here you go, hackers. I got you a gift. It's trying to get some <laughs> some dark web clout. I could see. Yeah, it. I could see exactly. It. They've got a, a TikTok account that's like, here's how to get data from the latest ticketing breach. Go to my website. <laughs> exactly. Join my Discord where I talk about this, this, and this. Right. I think, I mean, so, okay. So if we're talking about phishing attacks, okay, obviously it's related to email addresses most of the time. Typically. But you know how everyone gets scam calls all the time about, you know, their car warranty being expired? Absolutely. I guess that's considered a phishing attack too, huh? Sure. Yeah. So, sure. yeah. you know, they could send you an email as a phishing attack, but then they could also call your phone through some spoofing and send you those automated messages and hope that they get some suckers that way as well. So it's yeah. like a double, double attack campaign to try to get your credit card information and still unfortunately it, it must work uh, because they keep doing it yep and obviously so. since covid has happened i can't imagine that this e-ticketing company ticket counter has had very much business at all mm-hmm. since everything has been closed so way back when covid first started we we started talking about how maybe some of these organizations that are getting directly impacted by covid and people not being able to go outside and not do social events uh, being targeted for uh, breaches so i think that this is still going on and i think this is an evidence of that so interesting speaking of buying servers and giving them away for free the next story donating data isn't the best nonprofit strategy the nonprofit organization Oxfam Australia confirmed that supporter information was unlawfully accessed in a suspected cyber attack. A database containing contact and donor information of about 1.7 million supporters was leaked online. For a majority of supporters, the database contained names, addresses, dates of birth, email addresses, phone numbers, and genders. It also contained donation histories and additional forms of information for a limited group of supporters. A small group may have had their financial details accessed. The charity has contacted all its supporters to alert them of the incident and is now notifying them about steps to take to protect their information. This is like the perfect ground for a phishing attack. Think Mm -hmm. about it. Here's a list of all these people and how much money they've donated. They know exactly which people to send an email that says, hey, we didn't receive your donation. Please go here and and re-enter it for us. Thank you. Yeah. Or, you know, they could also make like one of those off brand Sarah McLaughlin commercials and post that on <laughs> YouTube and then, you know, send and just that solicit and, you know, and say, fake hey. donations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Uh, definitely kind of scary, especially considering, I mean, you donate to a charity because you want to be a good person and you want to support a cause. And then it's also a nonprofit. So to turn around and hack that is. It's kind of not a good, I mean, it's definitely, you don't have any morals <laughs> from that perspective, yeah, but um, it's, it's scary too. Cause it's, I mean, I can't imagine that nonprofits necessarily have a lot of the cybersecurity safeguards in place because they're not working for profit. So unless it's mandated by the government, but I mean, a lot of times they're, they're, they're trying to get money from the government to stay afloat other, if they aren't getting enough donations. So. Absolutely. And and we're talking big bucks mm-hmm. for charities like this. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars just from individual donors. So not good. And that's it for this week's wrap up of your weekly healthcare news. I'm Alex Ross. And I'm Matt Moneypenny. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Bandage. This week's episode was written and produced by eTactics. eTactics is a leading revenue cycle solutions organization committed to providing innovative, web-based solutions that improve our clients' cash management and customer relationships. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.